say that again. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning, and thank you to everyone who's streaming in with us live, um, live stream. Um, we're really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Hari Han, and for those of you I don't know, um, I am the inaugural director of the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. I want to thank the Stavros Niarcos Foundation for creating the opportunity for us to be here today, for helping us organize and host today's event, and for opening this gorgeous space up for us to use and providing all the on-the-ground support that um, the entire team has provided over the past few days, so thank you. I also want to thank all the speakers who have come um, to join us here today. You're going to hear more about them and from them shortly. For those of you who don't know much about the SNF Agora Institute, we were founded in 2017 with a transformative gift from the Stavros Niarcos Foundation. We are an academic center and a public forum that is dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed, inclusive dialogue as a cornerstone of global democracy. Since our founding, we have participated each year in events around the Nostos Festival, but for the past two years, many of our events were online, and so this year you can imagine how excited we are to be able to be back here in person in Athens. The SNF Agora Institute has expanded significantly since the last time that we were here on the ground, including bringing an important and a very impressive group of faculty to Johns Hopkins University, um, who are all endowed by the Stavros Niarcos Foundation. So I just want to take a few minutes to show you a video that will introduce these faculty and a bit of the work that we're doing at the SNF Agora Institute. When we think about democracy and its original formulation, it was about sort of the capacity of people to act together. For me, the big question is, how can democracy survive and thrive um, in the United States, at a local level, national level, and globally? What we're finding now is democracy feels fragile. I'm trying to answer a lot of questions that have to do with the long-term historical and economic transformations that have made it more or less possible for women to participate fully in public life. Power concedes nothing easily. And it certainly concedes nothing when it comes to questions of inequality and race and racial difference. First, we need to think about what type of democracy we want. So I look at partisanship and polarization and thinking about, you know, sort of solving this increasingly radical partisanship that we see in our politics. We find ourselves in a world where there is disinformation, there is misinformation. There are all of these flows that we have to begin to think about how they affect democracy and the information associated with elections, so I think, is being crucially important. I am trying to answer how people in civil society, how organizers can be more successful, uh, especially in authoritarian contexts when it's very difficult to do collective action. We think about like all the kinds of problems that we face, things like climate change, low education, immigrant health. All of them involve lots of people who are working to solve them all over the place right now. And so the core question for me is sort of how can we bring these folks together to work together to come up with better ideas and better solutions to these kinds of problems. So the SNF Agora Institute is designed to engage people in the contestation, struggle, and deliberation that make democracy work all over the world. The investment that Agora represents to bring together people who are brilliant in across their fields, to ask not just how do we fix it, but how do we first understand the problem better. To me, that's exactly what a university ought to be doing. Agora is central to exploring questions around democracy, but it is also central, I think, to the public conversation in ways that are transformative. A democracy is not just a set of rules, it's not just a set of practices, but it's actually a set of uh, commitments and beliefs and, and connections to, to one another. So the Agora Institute is a really exciting place to be. And hopefully this synthesis of these particular people will be able to provide this really sort of rich creative ground from which we can build something completely new. So of course the SNF Agora Institute takes both its name and its inspiration from the ancient Athenian Agora, um, the birthplace of democracy where citizens came together to learn the rights and responsibilities of citizenship and develop the capacities they need to be fully engaged citizens in democratic life. We'd like to say that taking collectively our work or our mission at the Institute is to try to realize the promise of the ancient Agora in modern times. 
But over the past few years, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated in stark terms the idea that human health depends deeply on how well governments, and in many cases democracies, are actually able to function. And conversely, at the same time, the health of a democracy, its ability to safeguard the health of its citizens, depends on how we all take part as owners and curators of our own democracy. So today's symposium is really looking at the relationship and about, between the often unexpected ways that human health and democracy are connected to each other. And we'll be talking about ways that active citizenship can lead to real change in the health of our communities. To kick us off, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Audrey Tang. Good morning, Minister Tang. Um, Audrey Hello, Tang. Audrey Tang, as uh, many of you probably know, is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. She is a tech entrepreneur and activist who has done trailblazing work using technology and data to empower citizen participation in governing. She is known for many things, um, including revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell. I probably pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry. Um, and for co-building the online spreadsheet EtherCalc. In the public sector, she has, served as in, she has served on the Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee and the 12-year Basic Education Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. In the private sector, she has worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. In the social sector, Tang contributes actively to Gov0, a vibrant community focused on creating tools for civil society with a call to, quote unquote, fork the government. That's their phrase, not mine. And so important to, today, to today's conversation, Minister Chang's leadership was integral to Taiwan's leadership to COVID-19 and for using technology and citizen participation to manage the pandemic. To improve contact tracing, she developed what she calls a people-public-private partnership among civic tech leaders, the country's major telecoms and the government to develop 1922 SMS, a system that needs, gets needed data to contact tracers without the need for an app. And she did it all in a week. It's innovation at its very best. To help Taiwanese citizens better find available masks, she made pharmacies mask inventory data open and available to the public in real time. These are just two small examples of many ways Minister Tang has worked with citizens to innovate and better deliver services, strengthening the health of her country and strengthening its civic fabric in the process. So Minister Tang, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, good luck time. Really happy to be here. It's the first time I heard the entire bio pronounced 100% uh, correctly. Uh, so uh, a, a really, really good to be here. Now, uh, I have just slides for less than 10 minutes. I look forward to more of a Q&A, uh, but just to give you an outline of how we countered in Taiwan the pandemic with no lockdown, without a single day of lockdown. Uh, and we countered the infodemic, which is like pandemic, but for mental health, uh, without any administrative takedown. Uh, and that relies on the health of our civic technology sector, uh, the civic sector, uh, and also the three pillars of social innovation, and that's fast, fair, and fun. The first pillar pertains to this civic technology called PTT. It's often said to be Taiwan's Reddit, except it's open sourced uh, and not funded by advertisers or shareholders. It's a National Taiwan University student pet project for more than 20 years. So uh, at the last day of 2019, people on PTT already reposted Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan, triaged the message. Instead of getting uh, derailed into polarization or conspiracy theories, it resulted in decisive action so that we started health inspection the first day of 2020. Now, it's not just for people who can connect to the internet and forums, although in Taiwan broadband is a human right, uh, even the very young or the very old can just pick up their phone and call this toll-free number 1922 to speak their mind and contribute to the digital democracy. For example, in 2020 April, there was a young boy who called saying, you're reaching our mask, which is great, but all I got was pink ones, which is not great. All the boys in my class have got a blue mask. I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day on the 2 p.m 
press conference, all the medical officers wore pink, and the Minister Chen of Health and Welfare even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. So the boy became the most hit boy in the class, and that's by the suggestion of the participation officers or POs, dedicated people in each and every ministry is in charge to uh, take on the civic technologies and communicate with the public to meet people where they are in the here and now. Now, uh, you already heard about the mask rationing part, but I would like to say it's not my invention. <laughs> I didn't do it in three days. It's the GovZero Collective, a community of people who fork, which means take what the government offers, but present in a different way without writing the original implementation off. And the domain name G0V.TW means that for each and every government website, something that GOV.TW people don't like, instead of just demonstrating against it, they can demonstrate with the government by building open source uh, alternatives that ends in something that G0V.TW. So just by changing O to a zero in your browser bar, you get into this shadow government that offers better services uh, and it's free of copyright restrictions. So when they, for example, made this real-time visualization, we can simply say, okay, it's a reverse procurement. The people already uh, let us know what they want. So people queuing in line can uh, refresh uh, their map every 30 seconds and see the real-time inventory. All we need to do is to make sure that the open API, the real-time data is uh, we trust the citizens with such data this not only resulted in more than 100 different tools that distributes the mask and later on rapid testing kits but also allows uh, the parliamentary interpolation to take on very different nature uh, when the opposition party's uh, MP uh, asked the minister well according to the open stream map community you say you're fair like each citizen on average is of a very similar distance to next available mask but what we have analyzed is that because not everybody own a helicopter What's the same distance on the map does not translate to the same time cost or opportunity cost for people to travel. But the ministers simply say, yeah, MP um, Gao Hongan, uh, you, you're correct. Now teach us how to do it. Lecture us. Because uh, the citizen now has exactly the same data as the government do. We do not hold the data. So MP Gao, because she was the VP of data analytics at Foxconn, she immediately said, okay, let, let's uh, work on this together. And we wrote out pre-registration and more fair distribution method that takes care of rural areas within 24 hours. So that turns what used to be opposition between two parties or many parties into co-creation dynamic. Now, finally, to counter the infodemic, we rely on this idea of humor over rumor. The idea is to make sure that the scientific clarification has an even higher uh, basic transmission rate on social media compared to the conspiracy theories. So, for example, the Ministry of Health and Welfare has this very cute spokes dog who literally is the animal companion of the participation officer, so a real dog. Uh, so whenever there is a new uh, policy like physical distancing, uh, they just go back home, take a new photo saying, uh, when you're indoor, keep three Shibas away, when you're outdoor, keep two Shibas away, and that spreads faster than the conspiracy theories. When it comes to mask use, for example, uh, we have this very cute picture where the dog put the food in their mouth and said, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own dirty, unwashed hands. Again, this went absolutely viral, and it does not um, you know, talk about uh, any other dispute uh, scientific um, characteristics early in the uh, infection, the pandemic, but rather it's very intuitive and it links mask use to hand washing and so on. And whenever there is anything that goes viral on social media that may be misleading, that's misinformation or disinformation, we again rely on the GovZero community who have this chat bar called Cofax, where you can invite to your end-to-end -end encrypted chat channels, and you just simply forward to the bot any misinformation you hear anywhere, just like flagging an email as spam, and it posts to a Wikipedia-like community where people meet every week uh, to triage the most uh, trendy uh, rumors and find uh, funny uh, countermeasures to it. Of course, the most viral ones ends up uh, getting the vets uh, from the International Fact-Checking Network, uh, like the Taiwan Fact-Checking Center, or Michael Penn and so on, and ends up we take a uh, notice and public notice approach uh, where the clarifications are displayed uh, prominently in social media. And that's how we do not take anything down. Uh, this example is very funny, and it's before the pandemic. Uh, basically, there was a rumor that was detected as trendy this way that says the state is going to fine you $1 million for perming your hair many times a week. Uh, and then within just two hours, the participation officer rose out this counter meme, uh, out-maming them, saying, 
is not true. And you see our premier head of cabinet in his youth saying, I may be bald now, but I used to have hair, so I will not punish people with hair. And what we've actually introduced is a labeling of like requirement for hair products. Uh, but then uh, on the bottom, uh, premier say looks now uh, says with a hair blower, uh, if you perm your hair multiple times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Your hairstyle will resemble mine. Uh, again, this went absolutely viral and we do not uh, need to take anything down because it's like a vaccination of the mind. People who have contacted this kind of viral vaccine uh, turn their outrage into something that's humorous and therefore become immune uh, from the conspiracy theories and the polarization. So uh, I want to skip a few slides and finally uh, simply say that the contact tracing system is yet another co-creation for health that's created in the, in the GovZero community. Basically, without downloading any app, you can just look at the venue's QR code using your built-in camera. Again, it sends a toll-free SMS to the 1922 toll-free number. And what it does is that it's like post-it note in your local telecom. Instead of sending anything uh, to the venue or to the state, it just stays there for 28 days and it gets deleted. Uh, and then uh, when the contact tracer wants to send exposure notification and so on, there's an automated system that provides reverse accountability. So anyone can go to this website and see in the past four weeks, which contact tracer have accessed their data for what, for reciprocal transparency. And by not downloading an app, even people with feature phones can simply manually text those 15 digit random code. So it obviates the need uh, to buy in into any specific technology. Of course, uh, you can still uh, write your naming or stamp your way in. This is all plural innovation, but this is privacy preserving because it was created in a community that cares about the uh, privacy and um, democracy affirming technologies. So to conclude, I understand I only have one minute uh, left. Uh, I will simply read you uh, my uh, job description, which is a poem that I wrote in 2016, uh, almost six years ago when I became the digital minister. I initially said as digital minister for civic uh, technology, what's important is the SDG goals, uh, 1718 reliable data, 1717 effective partnership, and 176 open innovation. But the HR department said, uh, minister, nobody memorized those SDG goals. You have to speak in plain language. Uh, so I translated that into a prayer, really a poem, which I'll very quickly read for you. And then I look forward to the Q&A. My job description goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Minister Tang. Um, I love that you ended with that poem. It's such a beautiful way that encapsulates, I think, a lot of the things that we want to talk about today. Um, so the first question I actually want to start with, um, I want to talk more about the work that you did in Taiwan, but I'd love to hear just how you as a technologist got interested in questions of democracy. And um, I wonder if you could tell our audience here about what the Sunflower Movement is and how that called you into getting involved in these kind of public sector initiatives. Certainly. Uh, so in Taiwan, democracy and the internet, they're not two things. They're literally uh, in the same breath um, became uh, possible in Taiwan. The first presidential direct election in Taiwan 1996, when I was 15 years old, uh, was also the year that the World Web got really popular. So we've got the same set of people who are dot-com entrepreneurs and also democracy, social entrepreneurs. That's uh, something that's very different. So from the very beginning, when we're designing our democracy, like semiconductor, to design, right? We iterated on that with a lot of participatory, the deliberative community organization, nonviolent communication, open space. For us, this is all in the same generation of people. So this is the, the answer to the first question. The second one is that in 2014, indeed, I was part of the team uh, who occupied the parliament very peacefully for three weeks uh, in demonstration, uh, first against the sudden signing of the cross-strait service and trade agreement with Beijing. But later on, within just 
a night because we uh, live streamed everything is thoroughly nonviolence. We turned this demonstration against something into a demonstration, a demo for something. And that is with half a million people on the street and many more online. How can we actually do what the MPs refuse to do at a time, which is to deliberate about the CSSTA in a uh, kind of focused conversation method uh, facilitated by professional facilitators, helped by civic technology so that people can, unlike many other occupies, can actually converge on a shared common ground, a shared understanding. Uh, and we finally distilled down to like four demands, uh, not one less, uh, which was then ratified by the head of parliament after three weeks. So it was a successful uh, Occupy. And right after Occupy in the end of 2014, all the mayoral candidates that supported open government get elected sometimes, surprisingly, and the ones that did it well didn't. Uh, and so uh, the civic technologists, including me, were then hired as reverse mentors, uh, young consultants, really, to the cabinet to push the open government agenda. So uh, pivoting from your own story then to the experience that Taiwan had during the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what you think it was, like what were the ingredients in Taiwan that made possible the kind of co-created response that you're describing? Um, do you think it's something mm -hmm. that was unique to certain features about Taiwanese politics or Taiwanese culture, or are some of the principles that you're talking about portable to other mm -hmm. places around the world? I think it's quite portable. Uh, for example, the mask rationing map was adopted in South Korea within just a few weeks. Uh, the dashboard in Japan, in the Tokyo metropolitan area, um, at least uh, in just a couple of months, and so on. So, uh, of course, we have some horizontal peer-to-peer -peer GitHub uh, oriented civic tech alliances. But beyond that, uh, I think this co-creation from civic tech uh, community relies on this idea of, uh, as I mentioned, people-public-private partnership. That is to say the people says the norm, like what's acceptable in contact tracing, what's not acceptable. And the state just amplifies that norm. And the private sector, including, as you have seen, telecommunication companies or convenience store chains and so on, just implement the norm that is set by the civic tech people. Whereas in many jurisdictions, the state uh, first already adopted maybe a Google, Apple uh, private sector uh, protocol or a state-oriented uh, state surveillance protocol or whatever, and that would decimate the agency of the civic sector. The civic sector thrives because they know that they are the norm setters and uh, they become much harder to operate if the state take on a top-down, lockdown, shutdown approach when it comes to the civic space. So one of the things that's so interesting in what you're describing is that the government was really open to a lot of ideas from the citizens and so that people, um, innovators like yourself or people that you were working with could come up with these ideas that government would then adopt. And we don't necessarily see that same pattern all across the United States. And I'm wondering, how did you, what did you all do to create that kind of openness um, from government and what advice would you have for people that might work in different contexts? Well, in different contexts, for example, the collaborative fact-checking, cofacts.org, if you take out the plural, uh, cofact.org, you find a Thailand uh, version of it. And of course, operating in the Thai uh, political landscape, they focus more on consumer protection, like dispelling rumors about food and drugs and things like that, uh, or things about environment, things that are less politically sensitive. But that was the case in Taiwan, too. Uh, when I was a child, uh, we were still under martial law. And and we cannot uh, talk publicly about politics, but we can talk about environmental protection, national parks or air pollution. Uh, and all these uh, civic technologists first work on those relatively non-politicized issues. Uh, that is a partisan or uh, non-partisan or all partisan, right? Pan-partisan. Uh, so you're seeing the PM 2.5 measurement stations set up uh, by the civics teachers, the environmental science teachers, and so on to measure PM 2.5 in the entirely grass roots way. But when it became uh, apparent that the state can, uh, you know, cannot refuse uh, these facts that those people have gathered, then of course we work on the civil IoT project to measure the points where the uh, primary school teachers cannot break in and uh, uh, to measure like industrial areas and parks. But again, this is the civic sector setting the norm and the trust, the fa fabric uh, resulting from this kind of collaboration eventually would become the uh, infrastructure that powers the mask rationing the rapid test rationing, all the different maps that you see during the pandemic was because there's already a mutual trust between the open data and API platform on the state side and the civic capacity on the civic tech side. It's such an interesting story um, about the way in which this you took this 
pan-partisan issue, um, to use your terminology, and then use that as a way of building up the capacity both within government and in the civic sector, um, and, and how that laid the foundation for what you all were able to do in the future. Um, that's really interesting. And I wonder, do you think cultural issues, like the culture of Taiwan plays a role at all, or, or do you think um, the kind of infrastructure that you're describing could be built anywhere? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it could be built anywhere because to me, uh, it's just uh, a matter of bandwidth, of latency and of connections, right? So just like upgrading from 3G to 4G to 5G technology, democracy used to be a very low bandwidth. Uh, like if you uh, vote uh, one candidate out of eight, that's just three bits. Uh, very high latency, like every two years or every four years. And very few connections, like just with adults, with citizenship and so on. Uh, but with digital infrastructure, we can basically vote all the time. We just concluded a round of quadratic voting, which is a new voting method with much better synergy uh, and promotes much more truthful voting on the presidential hackathon. And every year we have more than 200 different uh, ideas corresponding to the SDGs that builds data collaboratives that we invite people to vote. But because this is um, not a zero-sum game, right? People who prefer such SDG to be prioritized, not necessarily necessarily reject the other SDG target. They just want something to be prioritized before the other. So every time we finish a round of quadratic uh, voting, we get fresh people who initially were working on some other problems, but they understand, oh, now we have to focus on these problems, but they still pivot their ideas and open source technologies to work on those common ideas. So every year we give out five of those trophies and those um, teams that were voted in uh, that delivered something locally for three months, the social innovators, once they get a trophy, uh, this is actually a micro projector. If you turn it on, it projects our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, giving you the trophy. So it's very meta, uh, promising whatever you did locally will become national level with all the fiscal, budgetary, and personnel support. So that's yet another way to just exercise those relationship muscles with the civic tech community that uh, has some local um, champions, but really uh, strive to make it a civic fabric into a public infrastructure. Yeah, a lot, one of the things that we say a lot at the SNF Agora Institute is the idea that democracy is a muscle, and so people have to practice it. And if they don't have the chance to practice it, then it atrophies just like um, our, our human muscles might. Yep, yep. Um, so one of, the, one of the themes that's running through a lot of the examples that you're giving us, I feel like, are um, themes about innovation, about infrastructure, and about collaboration um, that exist in a lot of the examples that, that you give. And along those lines, I've heard you describe yourself as a conservative anarchist, which that's I think right. also has mm -hmm. a lot of those themes in it. I wonder if you can describe mm -hmm. to us, what do you mean by conservative mm -hmm. anarchist. Sure. Uh, so uh, basically, I could also say uh, I'm a spiritual Taoist or philosophical Taoist, uh, but still people would think that I perform some religious rites uh, or something, but I don't do that. Uh, so uh, to be conservative is to uh, respect traditions. In Taiwan, we have more than 20 national languages. Uh, and we, when we work on, for example, marriage equality, we have to respect all the 20 uh, different cultures, some of them matriarchy, some of them doesn't really care about gender when uh, choosing the successes. Uh, and so one, uh, 16 of which indigenous. Uh, and so because they are all national languages, they need to be conserved equally instead of pushing an agenda that's a progress by uh, one particular language and then uh, decimates the possibilities of the other languages. And I'm an anarchist in the old sense, like uh, I don't give orders, I never take orders. So I work with the government, I don't work for the government, but yet I work with the citizens, not for the citizens. Basically, I'm just uh, working out the common grounds in which the people can innovate to deliver on those shared concerns, but I never uh, coerce anyone to do anything. So I'm not bomb throwing, uh, I'm a forking uh, the code anarchist. Yeah. Uh, that's great. So um, that asked me, leads me to another question. So this morning, some, we were here in Athens, Greece, and I'm sorry that you couldn't join us here in person, but um, this morning some colleagues and I were um, at the um, ancient Agora, uh, the original site, the birthplace of Western democracy. And we were walking around and sort of learning about how they, um, the ancient Athenians practiced democracy. And one of the questions that came up is, what is the extent to which the kind of democracy that was practiced in ancient Athens is possible at scale, you know, at, at, at the level of a nation state like the United States or, or much bigger countries? And uh, that same question comes to mind as you're describing what you mean by conservative anarchy. Is, th is that kind of spirit of respect for traditions with simultaneous mm -hmm. Um, anarchy or, or, or um, mm -hmm. you know, co-creation yeah. possible mm -hmm. um, at, mm -hmm. at a very large scale. 
Yeah, very much so, uh, because the very large scale is actually an intersection uh, of a plurality of existing social communities. So instead of working to disrupt such community, we need to respect, uphold uh, those community. For example, uh, in 2015, when UberX first entered Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is not the only jurisdiction uh, in which that there is a large debate about whether it is a sharing economy or gig economy or anything like that. But we built a digital agora using Polis, a digital digital uh, infrastructure in the public sector uh, that's open source in 2015. Now, uh, you can see like a real Agora, I see my friends and families uh, on social media and elsewhere, uh, like scattered around based on how they feel differently about the same facts when it comes to ride sharing in general. Uh, but just like a real open space technology facilitation, this space promotes pro-social uh, conversations and understandings. So you can see, for example, I feel passenger liability insurance is important. And if you agree, you move toward me. If you disagree, you move farther away from me. But at no point do you have a reply button. So there is no room for tro to grow. The only thing that you can do here is to promote something else. And we only hold ourselves accountable. We pre-commit to say, if you have the 10 best uh, resonated feelings and ideas that can convince everyone across the aisle, all the different four groups, then if the four communities all totally agree on some values, then we just deliberate on that and use that as a basis to regulate the Uber case in Taiwan. So we respect existing community, including taxi unions, but also the rural areas uh, self-service um, transportation services. Uh, and only the idea to convince all of them ends up making the cut when it comes to the rulemaking. So in the V Taiwan rulemaking method, we actually see that people agree to disagree on just 5% of the things like gig economy. But actually, most people agree with most of their neighbors across communities most of the time. And this reflection is not the picture that people have in mind if, if they are on the more antisocial corners of social media or traditional media. And so to get this picture into all the different communities' mind, that the communities actually have this overlapping consensus is the key to scale this kind of deliberative conversation across different communities to a national scale. That's great. So that actually pivots us nicely into another question I want to talk to you about, which is thinking about more broadly health of democracies. And in the United States, where the SNF Agora Institute is based, for example, um, there's a lot of concern about the ways in which social media in particular, and in some cases digital media overall, have really emaciated or hollowed out our ability to practice democracy in the ways that we might aspire to do. Um, yet Taiwan's experience in the ways that you've been describing is actually quite different from, a, from the United States certainly and, and also a lot of other uh, countries around the world. Can you tell us like, what was different about the way online space is developed in mm -hmm. Taiwan and what can other countries mm -hmm. learn from that experience? As I mentioned, uh, the online civic space like the PTT, uh, it's open source by default. It's maintained by uh, young undergrad students uh, in NTU and other universities. It's subsidized uh, by the National uh, Academy uh, Network without any worrying about uh, shareholder value, right? So it started as uh, for purpose, not for profit. So I often liken it to a kind of dedicated zoning, right? The PTT would be like a campus, polis would be like a town hall and so on. And Facebook would be like, I don't know, a nightclub or something in the entertainment district. So the problem is not that the nightclub uh, sells alcohols and addictive uh, material to underage people, although it is a problem, I guess, uh, but uh, that we do not have other public digital and civic digital infrastructures and spaces in our digital realm. So our mayors were forced uh, in other countries to bring their town halls into the nightclub. And then people say, oh, they get rowdy, uh, they say, alcoholic drinks, private bouncers ask you out for no reason, smoke for your room, you have to shout to get hurt. Well, of course, because it was designed uh, for such for-profit motives. So I think the Taiwan case succeeds uh, precisely because people in Taiwan understand that Facebook may be the place for cute cats or something, uh, but uh, to get something uh, that will uh, get into our collective decision-making process, you have to go to one of those civic or public spaces. That's so interesting. So what I hear you arguing for is a kind of plurality of different kinds of spaces. So we need the nightclubs <laughs> online, but then we also need mm -hmm. these publicly designed civic spaces. Mm -hmm. And so um, in places like the US where we haven't had that for purpose digital infrastructure that's built yet, mm -hmm. what do you think the possibilities are for constructing it now that so many people have been, and building an audience for it, now that so many people have mm -hmm. already been drawn into an infrastructure that was really built for profit, not for, not for mm -hmm. purpose, as you would say. 
Right. So uh, I think polis have been used successfully in, uh, in I think, Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, in, in many places. So on the community level, I'm quite optimistic. There are uh, quite a few community organizers uh, in the township level or a municipality level that have successfully deployed uh, such things. So uh, what I think is important is not to suddenly scale to the national level, because uh, the Taiwan example relies on everyone looking looking at the UberX story and have the same picture in their mind. But if you do not have such a PEM political, PEM partisan case uh, that works for everybody in the US, maybe do not start that uh, top down approach, but rather from a grassroots, from a bottom up approach and keep the local social uh, entrepreneurs and civic technologists well connected and also well funded. A lot of the uh, work that we do in Taiwan is just to make sure like the German prototype fund and so on, that public infrastructures uh, can uh, recover their research costs uh, very easily, either via grants or via uh, new like plural funding, quadratic funding, retroactive funding, pay for success. There are a lot of ways to ensure that uh, it doesn't cost them um, anything really if they launch something that works for just a few specific cases for a community. And if they well document it and publish it to public code, then the state or the municipal government um, just um, allows them to recover the cost and then move on to the next experiment. That would be my suggestion. And can you say a little bit more about what the relationship is between platforms like Polis or the, or the digital ways in which people can be involved and the kind of infrastructure or ways of involvement that pe that people might need offline? Mm -hmm. Like how does how does the online offline interactions occur mm -hmm. or need to occur? Yeah, certainly. Yes. So uh, in design, um, we make sure that uh, like the design thinking double diamond, right? <clears throat> so the initial exploration, uh, like making sure that all the different, especially people who didn't used to have a voice, like uh, residents, but not uh, citizens or people too young to vote and so on, they nevertheless have a valid SMS number so they can participate in the police platform, in the joint platform very easily and uh, explore together to discover together uh, what they have in mind when it comes to possible uh, norms. And then when we define things, then this is self-selection. In Taiwan, we only use sortition uh, to the largest project because sortition is quite expensive to run in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, but in the cases like Uber, where uh, we do not have the budget to do this for sortition, we would, for example, if it's the National Universal Healthcare, which we did do this sortition-based uh, full-scale participation. So for this like micro-scale uh, defined like finding it, how might we uh, questions together, then we just self-select the people who, as I mentioned, resonated with the most of the people across the different groups, across the plurality. We measure the diversity and invite the people who propose those very nuanced, eclectic ideas to serve as not representative, uh, just representing the ideas that also resonates with them in a multi-stakeholder discussion face to face. But we also um, just spread those conversations via live streams stream so people can still join uh, in real time uh, over Slido and so on. So we have this whole system of participation officers, POs, uh, that you can just search for participation officer Taiwan and we've held more than 100 of those uh, low budget collaborative meetings on the issues that either uh, have this police conversation or a join platform e-petition that have more than 5,000 uh, signatures and they can just summon our team to their locality to have this face-to-face -face conversation yet we broadcast that live stream that so people in other time zones can also join online. So one of the things that's interesting about what you're describing is there's a lot of ways in which um, the platforms that you're describing and the, the venues that you'll have created allow for people to self-select and engage in a, in a very decentralized way, which enables a lot of participation. Um, when I imagine how that might operate in the United States, though, I immediately worry about bad actors that um, would self-select into these very open spaces and then try to uh, denigrate the quality of the conversation that's going on. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what is the role that referees, if any, or monitors might play um, in a decentralized network or decentralized mm -hmm. platform like that? 
Certainly. So uh, in uh, participation, I think one of the golden rule uh, that uh, Wikipedia discovered very early on is that when you play this game of attrition, make sure that the moderator have to just spend this minuscule amount of time and effort uh, to moderate away a lot of effort uh, by the people who detract uh, from the process, right? So, uh, and the way that we automate away those uh, moderation is by crowd uh, moderation. In the polis, example, uh, in the Uber example, it's not always people who have, um, you know, a bad uh, intentions, but they do want to influence uh, the outcome. Uh, right after the Uber X case, I think Airbnb Taiwan uh, sent an email to everyone who have subscribed to Airbnb before in Taiwan and say, go to this platform and vote exactly this way <laughs> to support our, uh, our party line, I guess. Uh, but uh, it kind of backfired because only less than one third actually voted it away. Uh, the Airbnb wanted them to vote. And the reason why is that this is not a survey. This is a wiki survey where the survey questions are uh, written by the people who do the survey themselves. So because it's crowdsourced, it has a higher dimension for people to express their actual preferences. So instead of just voting the way Airbnb want them to vote, they see each other's ideas and start to resonate uh, with them. So a lot of this astroturfing or trolling behavior can be corrected if the trolls find it more fun. Uh, and more mentally rewarding, more intrinsically rewarding if they uh, act in a pro-social way. And if they get 5,000 bots voting exactly the same way, well, there may be an extra zero on the A group, but it doesn't count for anything because we measure the plurality of the groups. It doesn't really improve uh, their agenda's chances uh, to get deliberated because the agenda is only held accountable if it uh, convinces everybody across all the different groups. So just the way your pre-commitment shapes the discussion that of course works uh, toward mitigating those attacks a lot. Of course, we apply standard cybersecurity defenses, work with penetration testers, white hats, and uh, require SMS-based authentication. Great. So um, we need to start wrapping up our conversation. But um, before we go, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about, as we think about this relationship between technology and democracy, um, not only in Taiwan, but really all over the world, what do you see as the biggest challenges or the biggest threats that, that keep you up at night? Um, and then conversely, where are your sources of hope? Yeah, I think uh, if we think democracy as itself a civic technology, then that keeps me hopeful. As I mentioned, just like semiconductor design, uh, democracy is something that everyone can simply fork and to to do it in a in a different way, not necessarily better way, uh, but at least different. As I mentioned, uh, quadratic voting, quadratic funding, uh, retroactive funding, pay for success. All these are ways to do participatory budget and agenda setting in a way that's not disrupting the election process of mayors and presidents, yet allows the mayors and presidents to say, yeah, I commit, uh, pre-commit to the will of my people. So this is an augmentative view uh, toward working with representative democracy instead of a disruptive view, right? So going back to my conservative roots. Now, uh, if people continue to think of democracy as such a augmentative assistive technology, then I think there's a lot of uh, possibility in each of us and in all of us to create the technology that are appropriate, meaning that we take whatever the Silicon Valley people have made, uh, but adopt it so that it fits the norm of our local community. So it's technology in the service of local democracies, not the other way around. But if we stop thinking democracy as a technology that people can meld to remix and fork as they like, if the democracy people ends up being the very different from the technology people and they don't talk to each other, then that would be a quite hopeless scenario. Well, thank you very much, Minister Tang. I, um, you've left me with uh, two aspirations, which is um, one, I aspire to become a conservative anarchist like you. And, um, and now I'm reconsidering when the, we should make our motto at the Esnefagora Institute to fork democracy. So we'll take that <laughs> under advisement and let you know how it goes. But thank you very much for joining us. Um, please give Minister Tang a round of applause. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Thank you.